And the CEOs told me two things that for me were like the corporate equivalent of finding out that the icebergs were melting. First, they told me that they forecast that one in five of the world's largest companies that we all represent here today, one in five of those companies will fail in the next five years. And second, the majority of CEOs believe that their own company's past is brighter than its future. Now, I've been interviewing CEOs for more than 20 years, and I have never heard them so pessimistic about their long-term prospects. And they told me that, yes, there's the economic cycle, but this time it's structural. They've reached the end of growth with traditional business models. And if we look at the critical factors that investors use when they're making investment decisions, globally, and even more so in the US, the CEO is the single most critical factor closely followed by company strategy and vision. And surprisingly, financial performance is actually the least compelling factor for investors now making investors investment decisions. But don't mistake this new cult of the CEO for a return to old school heroic leadership. Actually, what investors are looking for is something quite different. They want self-disruptive, agile, test and learn leaders who can take people with them through the desert of no return before there's a burning platform to do so. And it's really interesting in the context of Climate Week last week in New York and also the announcement by the Business Roundtable recently that questioned shareholder primacy. It's interesting to note that investors really do acknowledge the importance of purpose and the importance of connecting corporate and social purpose to be a successful organisation over the long term. While we have traditionally thought of investors as the villains of our story, actually they, they really do get the business case for business transformation. In the US in particular, 76% of US-focused investors believe the companies they're investing in will need to deliver significant pivotal transformation over the next three years. So we get to the very interesting twist in our tale, which is that actually investors think the problem is the short-term CEO. Leaders don't think long-term enough. And when we ask them what they thought of uh, CEOs in the US, I'm afraid to say that actually 70% of investors told us that today's leadership stock of CEOs is not fit for the future. And so when we think about uh, being uh, future ready, it is also a transformation in regards to long-term thinking, but it's not just about the business for us. Um, prior to uh, the role I have today, I ran the business for Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. And it was then that we started observing that not just shareholders, but stakeholders were particularly interested about alignment of values um, with the, the organizations that they do business with. And so um, in the context of that, uh, we um, re-engineered our corporate social responsibility strategy to be one that was more global in approach, um, allowed for us to actually um, introduce innovation and, and, and sort of um, creative thinking within the company and also intersect our, our philanthropic endeavors with our um, uh, business alignment and our uh, long-term strategy. So I have to espouse a longer-term view. 2015, we took a stance of de-risking our balance sheet. So we moved from the most risky assets to the least risky, most highest quality, most liquid assets. When we started to talk this story and say that the world is more complex, surprises are highly probable, we look like the old crazy uncle in the corner on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, now, we've stuck with that view, and now we don't have that issue, but we've had to sell it for multiple years. And even a, a, an equity analyst, who I don't think is necessarily you know, totally on our side, but he has agreed, you know what, you guys have been consistent with your, your thought process. So as the CEO, I am the number one salesman at the company, uh, and I have to sell that vision, and especially in terms of, of integrating strategic and risk thought process. 
So we're really seeing a lot more selling with ideas. And similarly for companies to be seen um, by investors as well as having a vision for the future that goes beyond their immediate product set and actually looking at, you know, for a tech company, how do humans interface with, with technology in the future or for a company that's banking internationally, you know, what does the future of global trade look like? These are the sorts of issues that their C-suite customers want to hear about. They don't want to know about the products, they want to know your vision. And similarly, investors are rating you on the vision. So if we measure now the sort of marketing that works, the most critical thing for both investment decision making and buyer decision making from the C-suite is thought leadership. It's the ideas you share, it's the big thinking, it's the content. From our perspective, it's not around sort of throwing money at sort of broader world problems that we all care about. But for us, it's more around being very strategic around how we can actually have impact. And so um, in the context of that, for instance, I I'll give you one example of one of the pillars of our, our strategy, which is around economic empowerment and financial inclusion for small and growing businesses around the world primarily owned by women and underserved communities. And when I went to the board of the foundation to talk about sort of we're gonna shift and focus on this as our key, one of our key initiatives, um, they, we sort of talked about how do, you, how do we think about that in the context of alignment with the business. And what we, we talked about was the fact that we are, um, as we get ready for the future, we are also looking at expanding our audience of potential customers and are going down the risk curve as it relates to the size of companies. And my argument was um, we have to think about the fact that neither Google or Facebook existed 50 years ago. And if we were in a position to assist them in how they grew their business, back when they were just starting off, think about the brand loyalty you would have today. Right. And so, you know, I, I also mentioned that um, we are looking at really emerging markets as the opportunity markets for us. And so we, um, from a philanthropic standpoint, want to uh, intersect with our business strategy by helping to advance those businesses in emerging markets as soon as possible so they can ultimately become a part of our customer base. So that, that, that from our perspective, is how you really intersect philanthropy with a the, with the corporate strategy. All investors are not created equal. And will we actually see investors who are patient and who are ethical and who are creating funds for small businesses, diverse businesses, women-owned businesses? Will we see them having a competitive advantage in the future? potentially so because of their behavior. So I, th I think there's some really interesting trends there. And, and I think all of our clients are really embracing this technology. But the key thing is nobody knows the answer yet. So having a vision about what the possibilities are and communicating that thinking loudly is what attracts the customers to you so you can build a solution together. Because more and more now, you can't, one single organization can't yeah, build sure. that on their own. Yeah. It's all about the collaboration. And those yeah. partnerships between CEOs are becoming absolutely yeah. critical. I wanted um, to uh, talk about the intersection of something Christina mentioned around the, her, the biggest investment is on human capital and the aspect of technology and what that means in the context of um, being able to really attract talent in a way that um, Im changes the culture of the organization to be uh, more receptive to really creative and innovative thinking. And so um, in the in, as we consider sort of being future ready, it's not necessarily just around sort of the use of technology today or what we even see, but really creating an environment where the talent that we're attracting is one that feels empowered to really be creative and innovative um, within a culture um, that, you know, may need to transition. And so from, from our perspective, um, that is as important as um, the consideration for the technological uses today.